Okay, welcome back everyone. It's uh, 9.30 of 2015. We're going to continue on with our discussion of the Summa Theologia by Thomas Aquinas. We're going to take a look at uh, reason and revelation, and uh, we're going to look at those in conjunction with the theodicy question, and uh, why is there suffering, why is there a God of love, and yet we still have suffering. The basic theodicy, theodicy question in conjunction with uh, reason and revelation. We're going to look at it in seven moments. We're going to begin with the sacred science, which uh, abbreviates all other philosophical sciences, according to um, Thomas Aquinas. Revelation is a necessity because of our divine eschatological end that it has, we have been appointed for, because philosophical truth is only known by a few, and in order to bring us to a more certain way to salvation, and this revelation is to be accepted by faith. Now, revelation and sacred doctrine is a science that establishes moral exemplars and authority. The moral narratives offer examples to be followed, and the narratives themselves establish the authority of the individuals through whom we um, perceive as uh, authoritative for formulating doctrine. Note 3, there is one sacred truth, therefore the subject matter of philosophy is abbreviated under the sacred science of uh, revelation, because there is one sacred truth that abbreviates all other truth. Now, sacred doctrine is speculative primarily, but it will evolve to a practical phronesis for positing in historical reality. And the sacred science transcends all others because of its greater certitude, because it's because of its higher subject matter and because uh, it represents being ordained to a higher and further eschatological purpose as the highest wisdom it is the wisdom where God is known in himself alone and revealed to others and the principles uh, of this science as we've discussed before in the previous lesson are the Articles of Faith. We just finished the lesson on the Articles of Faith, but the um, self-evident principles of sacred science are the other Articles of Faith, the uh, 14 Articles. We do not uh, argue to prove the principles. We argue from the principles to prove something else. So we don't uh, argue to prove the Articles of Faith. We begin with Articles of Faith to prove other um, essential points of doctrine. Now, metaphor is employed in sacred, sacred doctrine to make truth accessible, to preserve um, the listener from error, and to hide truth from the unworthy. There are three spiritual senses in a sacred doctrine. Um, the allegorical sense is the old law prefiguring the new law. The analogical sense is the new law prefiguring the future glory. And the moral sense is where the deeds of Christ prefigure our moral oughtness, or our moral imperative. But this sacred science, this first moment of sacred science, it is the overarching knowledge and the overarching science for all other philosophical sciences. Every other philosophical truth is abbreviated under sacred doctrine and sacred science. Um, all philosophy, all rational thought is abbreviated under the sacred science. And so when we go to the second moment and look at philosophical science, it uh, cannot work directly with revelation. Philosophical science relies on demonstration. And we get an axiom right at the beginning. The revelatory essence plus the demonstrated existence results in rationally articulated sacred doctrine. So um, philosophical science is used for the clarification of revelation, the rational clarification, the rational articulation of what is uh, taken in faith in revelation. So philo philosophical science is secondary. It is secondary. It is uh, the articulating science, the uh, clarification type of work that's done concerning what has been revealed to faith. So it deals with demonstration. Now in itself, God's exist existence is self-evident 
because his essence equals his existence. We discussed that in the last lesson. Therefore, God can be known from his effects in five ways. And uh, we looked at these uh, back on uh, the lesson on divine essence, but we'll go over them again. Motion, God is the prime mover. Causality, God is the first efficient cause. Necessity, God possesses in himself his own necessity. And gradation of nobility, God is the cause of every other perfection and the measure of every other perfection. And then the fundamental and most uh, relevant point for Thomas Aquinas is teleosis. God is the design and the directedness and the order of all things. God is the design, the directedness, and the order of all things. That's going to be the key aspect of uh, the demonstration of effects for Thomas Aquinas. It's going to be the present historical effect of design in our historical reality. There is the, the evidence of spiritual design in our external historical reality. And that's the teleosis or the teleology of God's plan of salvation. So that takes us uh, to that diagram in the middle of the page where we see the uh, substance of the eternal Godhead as the uh, overarching enclosure. But the substance of the eternal Godhead encloses the sacred science of uh, sacred doctrine and the philosophical science that is abbreviated under it, which um, is simply for um, articulating the clarification of doctrine that we uh, apprehend and perceive through faith and revelation. So philosophical science is abbreviated under sacred science. Let's just take a look at that uh, joining together of the two and look at uh, block four, the actual uh, sacred doctrine. And sacred doctrine is an explication or an articulation of the Godhead. The Godhead is the uh, articulation of effects, doctrine based on the effects. Or as Thomas Aquinas says, God is his Godhead. And by using the term Godhead, we indicate that our intellect understands, understands God in a composite way, even though there is no composition in God. So our intellect understands God through his effects, through his works. And we articulate sacred doctrine according to the work of the, the works of the evidence of the Godhead at work. And that's the way that our intellect apprehends sacred doctrine. And there are uh, six aspects of this Godhead. Form, God is essentially form, not matter. Identity, God's essence equals his existence. Truth, God's existence becomes the empirical evidence of God's subsisting truth. So reality holds for us to observe and articulate God's subsisting truth. Principle, God is the principle of all being and actual. There's no potentiality in God. Therefore, there are no accidents in God. He is substance. He is the universal. God is not made up of genus and species. He is instead absolute being. As the being of all things, he enters into the composition of all things. And then uh, 3b, the word of God, is the uncreated form of an exemplar cause that uh, moves and directs and orders all of the things in historical reality. So it's the living word of God that becomes the living uncreated form, the form that existed in the beginning, the form of the living logos that was in the beginning with God, the Father. That becomes the um, uncreated form as an exemplar cause of shaping and ordering and directing and directing the uh, teleosis of God's plan of salvation. The teleology of God's plan of salvation is directed by and ordered by and organized by the uncreated form of the word of God as exemplar cause. So like I said, this is key for Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he keys in on teleosis as the foundational evidence of God. It's the teleosis of design, the design of God's plan that will not be thwarted, that will not be um, prevented from occurring because God's will will be fulfilled. We're going to get into that. But before we do, let's move on to block five, the realm of the living. We have our sacred doctrine, 
as articulated by the philosophical sciences that are abbreviated under the sacred science. And so we take sacred doctrine and we enter into the realm of the living and how we orient life through sacred doctrine. Now, living for Thomas Aquinas means things that move themselves uh, as a thing that is in its potentiality or as an act of understanding. Those are both movements. Therefore, to live is to be capable of sensation and understanding. And the highest degree of living is the contemplative life of an inclination toward God's, God's divine knowledge, contemplating and seeking to attain unto God's divine knowledge. That is the highest degree of living that a person can achieve. There are three levels of self-movement for Thomas Aquinas. There's a simple self-movement, the inherent natural form that every um, agent possesses. But uh, we can move to a higher level of actualization if we are an agent that acquires form prior to actualizing that form, or we get involved in actually uh, acquiring the universality of a form. That's a higher degree of self-movement. But the highest degree of self-movement is progressive movement, where our sentient power of the soul is perfected by the intellect, and the universal, universal form and the eschatological end of our trajectory are both acquired by us as believers before we enact our act of existence. That's really the contemplative level of contemplating the knowledge of God, because now we acquire universal form of what needs to be done in our lives and in history, and we acquire the eschatological end of God's horizon. That's the highest level. That's called progressive movement. If we move to a level of progressive movement, that's the highest level of existence as a believer. And that takes us to the realm of spirit. And so we're going to look at the block six as realm of spirit, and it's going to be the coupling together of sacred doctrine from block four and progressive movement from block five. So sacred doctrine gets enjoined with progressive movement, uh, and those two together create the, the realm of the spirit. But one thing that uh, we've discussed the realm of the spirit uh, in the last couple of lessons and the, uh, especially we've discussed the individual's work of uh, intentionality and uh, grasping and articulating a form and then actualizing that form in a practical way. We've discussed the realm of the spirit from the human side, from the side of the human individual believer. But in this lesson, because um, Thomas Aquinas is concentrating on the theodicy question, he approaches the realm of the spirit in this lesson from the point of view of the work of deity, the work of God, the will of God. So it's a great additional lesson because we haven't covered this before, but we'll take a look at the, the realm of spirit uh, based on God's will. And so if you look at block six, we're going to actually look at the divine will and the theodicy question as uh, considered by Thomas Aquinas. He gives us a Basically, uh, everything we need with regard to the realm of spirit and God's activity. And first of all, um, he brings up that concept of teleosis. God himself is the eschatological end of goodness with respect to all things. And then he brings up intentionality. God's intention is to communicate and to enact this teleosis of his plan of salvation as far as possible to others, to all individuals within creation. Now the concepts of necessity and defect, the divine will has a necessary relation to his goodness. He necessarily wants to enact his goodness, but a defect of effect can occur and it will be due to the sentient nature of the things that are willed because things are willed within a finite realm of existence within the realm of a uh, sarks flesh and finitude and so the a defect of effect could occur but it would be due to the sentient nature of the things within which God's will is willed as far as a uh, number four effects as first efficient cause the effects proceed from God's will and intellect that is the primary first efficient cause under means and purpose God simultaneously wills uh, the end and the means to his uh, purpose 
and he has a purpose to preserve his teleosis design of salvation. Of all things, he wants to bring forward and to move forward his teleosis design of salvation for all creation. That is his purpose uh, that uh, backs up and empowers his will. Now, as far as failures and fulfillment and suffering within this process, this teleosis, uh, Thomas Aquinas says a thing cannot permanently fall outside the teleosis order, but particular sentient causes can cause departures in one order, but it will return to teleosis in another order. It isn't a final separation ever. But there can be failures, there can be um, moments of falling outside of this teleosis plan of salvation, but Thomas Aquinas says they will not overpower God's teleosis plan and God's teleosis order of his will and his plan of salvation. That teleosis will be fulfilled, and so whatever does fall out of that teleosis order will be brought back by the Holy Spirit. It will be realigned to God's teleosis. Now, number seven, unchangeable. The will of God is entirely unchangeable. And then the efficacy of this teleosis. And here's where we can talk about omnipotence. No defect of secondary sentient cause can hinder God's will from proceeding according to his teleosis. No defect of secondary sentient cause can hinder God's will from proceeding according to his teleosis of the plan of salvation. But he does allow contingency because he does allow his created finitude. Therefore, God's will is necessary according to his goodness, but it is conditional because it takes place within a finite realm, within a sentient realm. So it is necessary but conditional. And that defines the efficacy of God's teleosis of his plan of salvation. But as far as evil is concerned, Thomas Aquinas defines evil as the privation or the absence of the order of the teleosis. Whenever we have a something dropping outside the order of God's teleosis plan of salvation, that's the evil, according to Thomas Aquinas. The ordering according to God's will is the proper good, but uh, God would never will against the uh, order of his teleosis of his plan of salvation. Therefore, God can never be um, given responsibility for evil. Evil is a privation, and God can never will this privation. But basically, we have a, a presentation of uh, the sciences, how they work, how we move from sacred science, and how the philosophical science and its rational work clarifies and articulates sacred science into sacred doctrine, which is articulation of the Godhead. It's the articulation of the effects of God's truth that are um, present for us in um, external reality. And uh, through this work of sacred science being enjoined with philosophical science, we can discern the truth of God's eternal Godhead and articulate that into sacred doctrine. Then we enjoin sacred doctrine with the realm of the living. And in the realm of the living, we are very much concerned about be becoming authentic authentically involved in progressive movement, progressive movement, the self-movement that takes up acquiring the universal form and the movement that takes up acquiring the eschatological end of God's purpose for his kingdom of God. If we take up eschatological end and form, then we're um, enacting progressive movement, and that's when we can enjoin with sacred doctrine and enter the realm of spirit. When we enter that realm of spirit, we're entering God's domain of efficacy, according to Thomas Aquinas. Rather than use the word omnipotence, Thomas, Thomas Aquinas uses the term, we're entering the realm of the spirit as the realm of God's efficacy. So it's the realm of God's save, the, the power of God's saving grace, the power of God's efficacy. So he doesn't really use the rationalistic term omnipotent. He prefers to use the term efficacy within the realm of spirit. I think that's a better term myself to use the uh, spiritual term rather than the rationalistic term. And so he says that it's the efficacious power of God that works in the realm of spirit and gives us our support for defending the theodicy question. And that wraps up our discussion of reason and revelation 
from the uh, Summa Theologia.